Well, good afternoon, and let me do a mic check, since I hear it booming. Is that okay? Okay. My name is Hunt Tooley, and um, my topic today is Western imperialism and the new Middle East uh, in, in World War II, slightly before it and uh, slightly after it. So I'm centered on World War II, um, and uh, what I'd like to talk about in particular is the uh, invasions of Iraq and Iran during the war, but i get around to that uh, in a bit. In a 1926 paper, University of Chicago international law expert Quincy Wright uh, spoke of recent events in the Middle East, and he wrote this. The Syrian insurrection, culminating in the bombardment of Damascus in October 1925, is an incident of a kind which has frequently marred the relations of Western powers with less advanced peoples. So bombing the city with defenseless civilians in it no army to resist, that has frequently marred relations, I think. It would mar relations with me, but a, a contemporary, almost writing at exactly the same time, and this is a letter that I found in, in the archives just last week, um, uh, another quotation about the same, uh, the same kinds of, uh, with well, the same, very same instant. Um, this is an Arab intellectual in Cairo, Nesim Saiba, who wrote, um, to an American friend, the French can be proud now and proclaim they have applied their mandate just as they intended to do. Nothing behind them is left but ruined cities and villages. The fields are uncultivated and the population is everywhere terrorized by the vandalism of their officers and soldiers. Cowards. They cry for help when the Germans invade them, but when fearing no punishment, their savagery knows no limits. Two sides of the same coin, I think. On the one hand, a less advanced people bring, being brought into line by the European power, uh, which had been designated to nurture the country toward government by the people. And on the other hand, a defenseless people brutalized by the power that has been designated to protect them. At this point, I have a third quotation, but since Professor Stone just quoted uh, T.E. Lawrence in exactly the same quotation, I'll let that stand and use, uh, use a little of that time. It was the quotation about 100,000 men uh, holding, down, uh, holding down Iraq at a time when, uh, uh, when there were insurrections and so forth. And, uh, and uh, in this letter to the Times of London, uh, T.E. Lawrence also says, in this most recent insurrection, and he's writing in the summer of 1922, we've just killed 10,000 in, in putting down this insurrection. So um, that's the magnitude that we're talking about. So uh, my point here with, with this quotation is that it's not just the French who were uh, carrying out their mandate in the Middle East brutally. Well, the years before and during World War II really shaped the modern the Middle East to create many of the issues now regarded as international problems and domestic problems in the Middle East too. Though we sometimes speak as if the imperial edge of uh, empire was blunted by World War I, the British, French, Americans, and Russians carried out many aggressive invasions there. This invasion occupation scenario repeated throughout the century represents a long-term rhythm in the imperial exploitation of the Middle East, though in every single case of invasion slash occupation, the invading power professed only altruistic motivations. My subject today is a rhythmic variation of this same pattern, and the variation is uh, World War II. The modern democratic interpretation of the two great wars of the 20th century carry a simple and uplifting message, uh, message for Americans, Britons, and other partisans uh, of the Allies. That message is, the world would have been okay had it not been for the Nazis, who wrecked the peaceful aspirations of democratic states like Poland and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, just carried their imperialism all over Europe. And if it hadn't been for the Allies, then well, peace and freedom would have, uh, if it hadn't, hadn't been for the Allies, uh, hell would have reigned, and if uh, the Allies had been in charge, it would have been peace, freedom, and democracy. I hope you will excuse me if I try to sketch a less enthusiastically allied vision of the uh, strategic and political picture here, and I want to do it in part by standing the standard allied narrative on its uh, head just a little bit. Uh, 
The mandate system which the Allies set up in the Middle East after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire uh, was clothed in high-sounding phrases like national self-determination and the expressions of the will of the population and helping people toward democracy. But by and large, the mandates were run as extensions of the pre-war French and British empires. The French ran Syria in particular with high-handed brutality with with the exception of Lebanon, where a fairly stable, multi-confessional regime, mainly Christians, emerged. As for Syria itself, the French were granted control by the peacekeepers, but found a, a Hashemite pan-Arab kingdom set up before they could get there. Uh, the, uh, the welcomed in Lebanon by the Christians, the French were feared uh, by both the populace and the existing regime in Syria, uh, hence, to take control, the French invaded and defeated the Syrian army in a, uh, a, a fairly bloody battle, a moderately bloody battle on July uh, 23, 1920, and they entered Damascus the next day, driving out the king, uh, uh, Faisal, the former head of the revolt in the desert, a friend of T.E. Lawrence. Um, revolts throughout Syria began almost immediately, and uh, the French uh, eventually, over the next uh, several years, would spend an inordinate amount of their time teaching the Syrians democracy uh, uh, by repressing insurgencies. The climax of violence came in 26 uh, when the French, holding on to Damascus, already having captured the city and from within the city, bombarded uh, uh, the other parts of it to kill uh, numerous civilians. British rule in the Iraq and Palestine mandates went only somewhat more smoothly. In both areas, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 represented a substantial problem for the British vis-a-vis -vis local elites almost from the outset of British occupation. The first new waves of Jews uh, who emigrated to Palestine in, in, in the sense of a, a, of a, a Zionist um, national home and, and with help from the international Zionist uh, movement, from contributions and the organization set up uh, uh, in New York and London and so forth. Um, this happened around the turn of the century, and a, and a, a number of people, uh, uh, a number of Jews came to um, Palestine at that time. Uh, but it was the Balfour Declaration, this declaration, that there was an official policy on the part of a great power that would in fact promote uh, this national home without really defining what the national home was. And, and with all kinds of Zionist speakers explaining that well, by national home we mean a national home where, uh, where everybody is, uh, is Jewish. Then, um, then this, uh, this uh, uh, shocked the Middle East, it shocked landowning classes in, uh, in Palestine and Iraq and, and, and everywhere else. Um, British clashes with the Palestinian opponents to the Zionist program began in the 20s, and um, pan-Arab nationalists in Iraq, Syria, and Egypt were all quite aware of such clashes, and uh, when needed, they fostered Palestinians who escaped the British, uh, the British authorities in, in, in Palestine. Put in charge of the mandate of Mesopotamia, or Iraq, the British uh, helped install uh, the recently booted Syrian king, uh, uh, now without a job, uh, Prince uh, Faisal, and made him king of Iraq. This arrangement suited the older British preference for indirect rule in its colonies. But in Palestine, traditional political leadership was more dispersed. Part of this problem would be solved by, uh, by installing Faisal's brother, Abdullah, as king of Transjordan, later Jordan, in 1922. Uh, so that Jordan was organized in the same manner as Iraq. But for the rest of Palestine, what we today call Palestine and Israel, um, it, local leadership was more dispersed, decentralized, mediated from the beginning, and the growth of Jewish settlement, along with rising anti-Zionist clashes, clouded this picture. Further complications um, uh, for British rule in the mandate uh, was uh, created by the resistance of the new Iraqi gover government to having an exploitative oil contract forced on the country by uh, an international uh, group of Western powers, including the League of Nations, in 1925. So a contract that they didn't want but was forced on the uh, country. Despite these problems, the British and Iraqi government worked out a 
treaty which granted partial independence to Iraq in 1932, though clearly Iraqi oil, Iraqi foreign policy, and much else was controlled by the British, who likewise retained the right to maintain air bases at Basra and Havaniya. Now, next door to Iraq, in other words, to the east, this uh, bigger, more, more uh, bigger, richer uh, country, Iran, um, had a surprisingly unrelated history uh, to uh, that of her poorer and less populous neighbor. Though oil and imperialism was crucial to the 20th century histories of both countries. Even in a short summary, we must go back to 1904, just momentarily, when the Iranians carried out uh, a constitutional revolution that established a parliamentary system run by elites who uh, were decidedly opposed to Persia being exploited by either the Russian or British empires. That's in 1905, in 1906. Um, Russia and Britain famously settled their differences uh, that they had had for over a century by creating the third leg of that happy a diplomatic pact, the Entente Cordiale, and transforming it into the still more cordial Triple Entente in 1907. And the occasion of this happy union of empires was the splitting of Iraq into two spheres of influence. So the countries just took, uh, uh, each took a chunk. The British and the South Russians next door to themselves. Um, almost immediately, Britain began laying plans uh, not only to exploit uh, Persia's uh, oil sources, but to uh, uh, to uh, make a use for that because the British then uh, converted the Navy to uh, 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 petroleum fuel from coal um, just after that, uh, that event so that they were now the largest consumer of, uh, of fuel in the uh, single consumer in the world and uh, they possessed all this oil in Persia. In World War I, though Persia was officially um, neutral, uh, it was still uh, uh, divided into spheres of influence, and it served as a kind of extension of the old great game between Britain and Russia, um, with the addition of the Germans at, at mounting uh, a, a kind of um, notional attack, uh, or a stirring up at least, attempting to stir up an attack on India, and also nationalist Turkish fantasies about a pan-Turanian empire resulting in Turkish uh, incursions, Armenian dreams of territorial ex exploitation uh, and ex expansion really came into the issue too, amazingly. And so uh, what this meant was that uh, for the war, uh, the result of all this fighting of different groups in different directions in different places um, uh, was part comic opera, part tragedy. Hundreds of thousands of bystanders died in the wakes of the crisscrossing armies, apparently chiefly by starvation and starvation-related diseases. So, last man standing at the end of the war, the British prepared to add the north of Persia to the south that they already possessed, uh, the Russians being occupied with the Bolshevik Revolution at that moment. Indeed, the British were just about to solidify a genuine protectorate status and just make Persia officially a, a colony when a new force emerged there, and this was a Persian officer who, in a sense, paralleled uh, Ataturk in calling for national pride, for rallying the forces of national unity, uh, uh, in fighting Bolshevik spillover from Russia, and various other uh, threats to the country. This individual was Reza Khan. And in 1923, Reza Khan managed to get himself named the Shah of Persia, except that he insisted on the older name of, of Iran, um, uh, which uh, uh, he thought was a name more linked to the ethnic groups that had settled the region many centuries before. Reza Khan, actually the now Shah of, of, of Iran, became fairly close to the British using the proceeds from oil deals to cement his modernizing and authoritarian rule. Still, the British were the main danger to him and to the new Iran, and the Russians represented slightly less of a threat. Uh, Reza Shah was also fascinated by some aspects of Italian fascism and by uh, the Nazi movement. And um, indeed, he clamped down on the Iranian parliament in 1925, and his autocracy faced substantial opposition from a number of, pol uh, of parliamentarians, including Mohammad Mossadegh, who would become a famous victim of the CIA uh, in the 1950s. 
In 1932, Reza Shah canceled the old Anglo-Persian oil contract with Britain, which had been a keystone of British control in the region. The Allied invasions of Iran and Iraq in 1941 and the subsequent wartime occupations followed patterns that, that really go along with these earlier trends that I've described and um, kind of tied these various strands of issues uh, together uh, closely. We have to hurry through the interesting details of these invasions, but a fuller story is available in, uh, in uh, a longer a paper that this uh, comes from, and that will be available uh, pretty soon. At the outbreak of the war, to get back to just Iraq, we'll take, do the Iraq invasion first and then the uh, Iran invasion. Um, Iraq was firmly in the Allied camp. I mean, the British had had it as a mandate and then let it have this uh, slight independence. And one reason that this could work was because the Hashemite monarchy was very relatively pro-British. And uh, the, their chief political man, now foreign minister, sometimes prime minister, was a, a person called Nuri al Said. Uh, Said. Um, and these were all committed to the British cause, more or less, uh, making it into the future by being loyal to the British. Um, one reason that Britain could, with some confidence, face the combined might of Hitler and his, his ally Stalin in, in World War II before June 1941 was that Britain felt secure in possession of this Iraqi oil. Yet some signs were, signs were clear that the non-aggression pact, pact would, um, would not last forever. Uh, moreover, uh, the massive German successes against Britain and France in 1940, and that was a really bad year for them, gave hope to anti-British nationalists all over the Middle East. One of the most important influences in these considerations was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. This was the head of Islam uh, in uh, Palestine. His name was Al-Hajj Amin al-Husseini. Al and he was the leader of, uh, of Islam and also the head of really the protests against Zionism in, in Palestine. Uh, organizer of anti-British riots and so forth. And uh, with the British after him uh, in uh, 1939, he fled and ended up in Baghdad. The Grand Mufti organized an Arab nationalist committee which entered into secret negotiations. The German the diplomats and officials at the highest level were assuring uh, the Grand Mufti's committee uh, that, uh, that uh, that they would support Iraq and that uh, the British were losing all of their, uh, uh, all of their battles uh, uh, and losing all their allies to Blitzkrieg and that it was an opportune moment to just declare war on the British. Um, by the end of 1940, even the pro-British uh, Iraqi foreign minister, Nouri El Said, began to consider whether an alliance with Germany might not be suitable. For most other Arab nationalists in Iraq and elsewhere, the British were the problem and the Germans were the potential solution. The monarchy was still loyal to the British, however. Um, standing in the role uh, of monarch was a regent to an underage prince. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the brother of Faisal had died in 1933. Um, Yet, as Britain found herself pounded by the Germans in the Battle of Britain, she increasingly uh, put pressure on Iraq to make more guarantees, to be closer, to give the oil at better prices, to, uh, to declare war on Germany, and so forth. Uh, a lot of pressure there. Uh, indeed, as the moderate nationalist Iraqi government tried in 1940 to sell oil to Japan in hopes of getting arms, which the British had consistently interdicted, the British blocked the financial aspects of the deal and threatened other economic consequences if the Iraqis did not support the war against the Germans actively. The United States was still theoretically neutral in the war, uh, uh, but um, the Britons had still had full support from Washington. Uh, in December 1940, Secretary of State Cordell Hall ordered the American ambassador in Baghdad to support the British, quote, with all possible aid short of war. And in general, the American State Department records show that the United States government, backed by Standard Oil Company and Sinclair and some other uh, companies, uh, held it as a core American interest that uh, Iraq support the British. It's significant also that Colonel William J. Donovan, Wall Street 
lawyer and um, and politician and government insider and just five months away from becoming uh, coordinator of information, the forerunner of the OSS and CIA, made a special visit to Baghdad in February 1941, among other things trying to gain uh, the Grand Mufti's support for Britain in the current dispute with the government. Uh, he was disappointed in this, but he may have worked out other arrangements while he was in town. We don't know the full story of this mission yet. To summarize, in 1940-41, the relations between the United States and Britain on one side and Iraq on the other were conditioned by the West's desire to um, uh, have free access to Iraqi, uh, Iraqi oil and also by the Iraqi desire to buy arms and outrage generally against the British for their policy, uh, policies in the Mandate of Palestine. So the stage was set, and uh, in April 1941, nationalist politician Rashid Ali al Gailani and four prominent uh, colonels led a coup which took over the previous cabinet. The government immediately demanded a new Iraqi treaty with more independent uh, terms for uh, uh, Iraq. It, and uh, in May 1941, the Grand Mufti declared a jihad against the British, calling for a general Arab uprising. And Hitler even mentioned the, the, these events in a, in a general communication, indicating he might su support, that Germany might support this. Uh, the British ambassador uh, in Iraq refused to deal with the new government, and uh, the Americans backed him up to m make a sort of long story short. Um, the, uh, the, the British and Americans put increasing pressure on the Iraqi government, and so the Iraqis just went and took a, an army down to Habaniya to take over the air base there. Uh, and while they waited and uh, fiddled around, the, the uh, local air base com RAF commander just simply organized an, an air attack on the Iraqis and, uh, and won the battle of Habaniya because they ran away. So uh, uh, the war was over a few weeks later, and uh, the Grand Mufti uh, took off. He went to Iran. Um, the, uh, uh, all the leading persons in the coup took off, and so it was a failed thing. Um, and an occupation ensued, which meant that it was total British occupation. Once the war started, the Americans were there too, occupying Iraq. It wasn't particularly horrible, but it was certainly an, occup an occupation in which the Allies were exploiting the Iraqis, in which Iraqis were poorer, in which foodstuffs were, uh, were taken away, and so forth. To turn to the Iran case, um, you remember Reza Shah is in power in the 30s and increasingly independent. The, the British were really upset at this, a uh, strong sense of uh, independence. And um, uh, increasingly, uh, Reza tried to turn to the Germans to trade, to kind of counterbalance the British demands that they, uh, that they uh, be the only trading partner in a kind of colonial situation. Uh, and so there were some contacts with, uh, with Germany. By the time of 1939, maybe, maybe a thousand German businessmen and, and technicians and spies and so forth lived in, in Iran. Um, it's also true that Reza Shah was interested by the Nazi fascination with uh, Aryans, uh, since uh, he himself, Reza, promoted a, an interest in the pre-Islamic history of I Iran and the Aryan race, and those words are uh, the same, basically. But most scholars these days conclude that there is little danger of Iran <coughs> becoming an ally of Germany in this war. Nonetheless, uh, uh, the, uh, the Americans and the British uh, uh, started, um, uh, started up the process of pressuring the Iranians, and particularly on this issue of German nationals who were, uh, who were living there. Uh, so, um, the, um, and I've kind of flipped to the wrong place in this, uh, yeah. Um, uh, this issue of national seems unimportant to us, a thousand Germans more or less and, uh, and so forth. But in fact, the Americans got on the horn and told the British, you've got to, you've got to stop them on this. This is the point that we pressure them on. And so this issue of a thousand uh, German nationals became the key. Of course, the real issue was uh, Persian uh, or Iranian oil. Um, and um, 
diplomatic records indicate a very substantial American oil uh, input of American oil interests. Uh, these are throughout the diplomatic documents, throughout the uh, foreign relations uh, papers, and so forth. Um, the Soviets were planning to attack Persia in a few months uh, when the Germans attacked them and they had to call it off. But from the moment that Russia changed from being Hitler's ally to being the Allies' ally, uh, June 22, 1941, Operation Barbarossa, uh, just three weeks after the British full-fledged occupation of Iraq began, um, taking Iran seemed an imperative. The Americans pushed for it. Now, remember, the Americans are not in the war yet. I mean, Pearl Harbor is still five and a half months away at this point. Um, but um, the Americans pushed very hard where they had dawdled previously in creating uh, contacts with, uh, with Iranian oil. And actually, the, the Shah had made some overtures to the United States uh, oil companies. But um, where they had dawdled, now the companies came in and started trying to get a, a high percentage because they knew that the, the Shah was, uh, would feel himself under the, under the gun. Um, in any case, uh, the, the Shah uh, would not relent, and uh, so the Allies attacked. Uh, the Anglo-Soviet invasion uh, occurred on August uh, 25th, or began on August 25th, two months after Barbarossa began. Lasted about three weeks. Casualties were likewise low here by World War II standards, civilian and military. The Iranians lost about a thousand dead. And so the British and Russians now divided up Iran for a second time within 40 years. Um, in essence, the Iranian occupation was a reworking of that 1907 division of, uh, of Persia, but this time with the additional support and help of the United States. Eventually, Reza Shah would be booted, um, and his son, the last Pahlavi Shah, the, uh, the more pliable and hedonistic Mohammed uh, Reza, became the Shah of Iran. This was just shortly after Reza Shah appealed to the Americans to enforce the self-determination sections of the Atlantic Charter in Iran. So the reply was to kick him out. Um, Yet both of these hard-pressed conquerors, the British and the, uh, and the Russians, and remember they both had the Germans uh, on their hands at the same time, both seemed unable to organize Iran, um, and shortages cropped up, and uh, starvation, uh, starvation emerged in very real ways. Uh, for one thing, they were disrupting all the, 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 the roads, uh, because the key to this attack had been the, the idea of getting a lend-lease road where the Americans could land supplies and take those supplies across Iran to Russia. So uh, using up all the trucks, using up all the resources, using up all the materials in the country, uh, there was really uh, they, in, huge privation was visited on the population. And it was only when um, Franklin Roosevelt sent a special envoy, Patrick Hurley, to Iran to make a report that the conditions were exposed, and a new group took over. The Americans importuned the Russians and British and took over. They brought in an American mission, put advisors at every level, and Patrick Hurley said, this is great, this is what we really need to do. Nation building, I'm quoting there, nation building, this is a wonderful thing. So they, uh, they carried out this uh, process of nation building. They had organizers at, uh, at every level, advisors to everybody. I think the most striking one is uh, Brigadier General Norman Schwarzkopf. Not the hero of the Gulf War, but the father of the hero of the Gulf War. Schwarzkopf knew a lot about police matters since he had organized the New Jersey uh, State Police. It, coincidentally, at the same time that William J. Donovan was state attorney of New York. Uh, they both fought prohibition together, and they were both in the OSS together. Um, and Schwarzkopf organized the, the state police, the gendarmerie of uh, Iran, and then came back for a second tour in the early 50s and organized the Sabak, the most uh, dreaded uh, secret police uh, uh, for, a, for a long time in the Cold War. In sum, the Iran of trucks, refineries, modernization, and highways comes in part from the legacy of Reza Shah and in part from this legacy of invasion and regime change. Just a few concluding remarks here, and um, I've got a couple minutes um, only. Uh, first of all, I intended this talk to be a story about the Middle East that explains 
some of the human misery of this region in modern times in terms of Western manipulation. But I realized in putting, together, putting it together that it also follows a kind of revisionist trajectory in, in talking about Allied behavior in World War II. So there was Allied bombing of civilians and these kinds of things, ethnic cleansing of German populations and all that. Um, and then there was the invasion and occupation, uh, etc. I'm not comparing here the Allies to the, or England and Britain to Russian occupation or German occupation. I'm just comparing them to their rhetoric of uh, the Atlantic Charter and other documents. Uh, Britain was, again summing up, still a very much an aggressive power in the Middle East after World, uh, before World War II and during. The United States became involved directly in the region at this, uh, at this juncture, especially with this kind of nation building uh, edge to the whole thing. In the end, I think that the story also points up a kind of generational aspect of American foreign policy there. Uh, so uh, during and after World War II, Norman Schwarzkopf uh, Sr. organizes the Shah's secret police, teaches Persians the good old SS techniques of interrogation, and then later his son comes back to smash Iraq just after Iraq has fought an eight-year war with Iran. It's something like a family business. And I think, I, I think there are several of these, many of these continuities in, in modern American foreign policy that we should pay more attention to. Um, you know, the issues in the end are the same issues from this period to the present. Uh, invasion, occupation, nation building, Zionists in Palestine, control of petroleum, and then a kind of distinct brutality uh, in the Western views of the Middle East. So one conclusion we might draw, as opposed to the old saw that in the Middle East they've been killing each other for centuries and constant wars and all that stuff, uh, that old saw just doesn't correspond to reality. Indeed, based on this little story I've told today, the woes of the resource-rich Middle East have come about chiefly um, uh, in these stories because of the imperialism and Western nation-building and other cynical interventions in the Middle East. Thank you.